All right. Hi, everyone. Very good morning. And I hope all of you are doing good. Uh, and thank you for joining this uh, webinar today. We are going to start in a couple of minutes, just uh, waiting for more participants. There are like around 190, uh, more than 190 folks the, who have like signed up for this RSVP on this 191, I can see. So uh, I think there is only fraction of it right now. Um, I want more people to be here probably in a minute or so. And what I will do is meanwhile, while others are joining, I'll quickly demonstrate our flagship product, which is Imagine View, uh, based on generative AI latest uh, uh, language models like GPT-4. And we are, I mean, leveraging the the you know power of talking to PDFs, uh, Excel, and text files, um, and any kind of textual information that is available in the web. So we can do web scrapping and then chat with it, right? So I will quickly show you guys the product that's called uh, Imagine View. This is uh, primarily a rag based application where, uh, you know, if you have a URL or if you have a PDF, you can basically chat with it. If you have an Excel file, you can chat with it. Uh, so I would recommend everyone to try out this. There is a subscription page here. And you can subscribe for free. That's uh, you will get around twenty-five thousand tokens uh, when you subscribe, and you'll be able to access GPT-4 and interact with GPT-4-based API and understand how this is working and what are the um, behavior of these. Right. So um, let's say once you subscribe, you would be able to come to the generative AI playground where you can either do a normal chat or you can do rag-based chat, which is basically up, up, uploading your PDF file or uploading a URL and you can start chatting with it. So let's say if I click here on the knowledge base miner and uh, I'll open this in a new tab and then I can see two options. Either I can drag and drop uh, PDF, PPT, CSV, doc or text files or I can also have an URL. So I'll quickly as a uh, demonstration, I'll quickly show you that you can basically go to any web page. So I'll like today we are going to talk about reinforcement learning as in the webinar subject. Uh, so this is a very beautiful blog by Sif Yuen. And, uh, she talks about RLHF and pre-training for compilation. What are the methods for it, right? Uh, data bottleneck for pre-training. So uh, let's say if I ask, um, if I update this um, particular blog, uh, into our Imagine View tool as an URL, right? And we can see that we are able to pretty much get those answers that are available in that blog. So kind of helps you summarize it. And you can give any kind of prompt that helps you summarize and make a better response out of it. So now let's say I will ask, like, what are the data bottleneck for pre-training, right? So I'll put a prompt here. It should ideally give me the results for, like, you know, um, the tokens and the, uh, the equivalent to how many, si what, what is the size of it, and um, what are the basically the limitations with a lot of data set that you have, right? So uh, the rate of training and size growth is much faster. So basically summarizing everything, right? So data quality, data volume, data diversity, ethical and legal constraints um computational resources data annotation diminishing uh, returns data relevance so now this maybe is a huge maybe i can change the prompt a little bit and uh, say like you know give me more precise answer with a summarized values and etc will also give you a, a better prompt prompt responses so that we it's just like you do in but it gives you kind of an ability to have better prompting techniques to Practical find out. Practical cancellation only. Huh? Practical cancellation only. Uh, this is uh, by Mr. Adip. 
or if you are anyone is speaking kindly put yourself on mute if you're not asking anything yeah thank you so um, similarly we can upload a pdf or excel or anything and we can chat with it so this is a quick demonstration about our tool which is imagine view and uh, i will be sharing the sign up link with all of you uh, if you guys are interested please please go ahead and sign up for this let me share the link in the chat with all of you yeah all right um so welcome everyone for this webinar um, which is about rlhf uh before i begin i'll quickly introduce uh, myself as vivek has uh, given my introduction so um i am uh, currently associated with cellstrat as an uh, director of engineering and mostly leading the um, uh, the tech side of uh, JTV solutions building and uh, and and also uh, architecting various features and solutions you um, i have a huge uh, background uh, in it uh, with 12 plus years of experience i have worked in various uh, technologies uh, especially in the data engineering field like uh, you know big data hadoop kafka etl and then uh, around 2016-17, I have moved into data science, uh, was working in machine learning initially. And uh, then I moved into NLP, got interested into NLP and NLP-based research. I, I did a lot of work at earlier also as a uh, you know learner and uh, a community contributor, because Salesforce is always a huge community of a um, lot of data scientists that are uh, uh, there today in India. Uh, and abroad so it it's a great um, uh, you know collaborative uh, platform that where we can uh, contribute and learn um, so i it's always a great pleasure for me to present um, uh, things as an uh, you know webinar and these webinars are meant on, only one goal that we have is to share knowledge and that everyone uh, understands what's happening uh, in the industry and we do not also have any kind of uh, limitations that what we are going to share and what we are not going to share because things that are happening around LLMs today, let's say, uh, it's an ocean of uh, uh, things, right? That are happening. It's a lot of information, but what to learn, what what not to learn, um, and uh, how to deep dive into those, right? So that we are going to discuss. So uh, everyone, I would uh, request uh, if you have any questions, any doubts please feel free to ask okay so uh, to get started uh, right uh, reinforcement learning with human feedback um, is anyone aware of what is reinforcement learning or what do we do with reinforcement learning anyone have any idea about uh, reinforcement learning the the third uh, i would say uh, third division of ai like we have NLP, we have computer vision, and we have uh, we have these. Uh, um, the other world is RL, right? So let me just quickly open that. Sometimes this notebook hangs, so I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So today's agenda is basically going to talk about reinforcement learning. Uh, primarily about RL and what is RL, and then the applications of RL in LLMs, and uh, the RL policies, human feedback. Human feedback is, uh, by the name, you can understand it's more of how do you collect human-specific feedback to improve the LLMs, and how do we de develop a reward model fine-tune um, and optimize an RLHF-based model and scaling the human feedback. So this is uh, the agenda. And I'll quickly show a demonstration, maybe not on a uh, whole running notebook, because it is going to take a lot of time. Um, but I will just show you that where you can find out 
uh, things to go ahead with RLHF and how you can train something of your own if you want to. It's a very resource ex extensive and um, I would say human extensive work uh, because as we say human uh, feedback. So it Im involves a lot of human um, interactions that helps those prompt responses make better. Okay. All right. So, uh, so these are the agenda for today's uh, webinar. Right. All right. So, I, anyone is aware of RL? As was I, I was asking, uh, what is an RL or what is a reinforcement learning? So, before we dive into that, the first uh, thing uh, that is important to know is language models are there for for long. And now we see large language models. And you all know that how do we actually now train these models? So there are different ways to build large language models, right? Either you train a large language model from scratch. That means you are basically collecting lots of data, curated data, and taking a base language model, train, with, train it with a lot of um, data over a period of time you need a huge amount of gpus definitely so that's very uh, uh i mean heavy work and that's kind of something that is not always easy to achieve um and not for all all of the organizations or the open source communities out there right um so what's the the next approach is like to do fine tuning while fine tuning is uh, I would say fine tuning is a lot more cheaper than training at LLM from scratch, but it is also kind of having a lot of uh, challenges. Like maybe uh, it is very extensive, uh, very expensive. Sorry, to collect ground truth of data, right? For a task like that, that helps you um, make a creative. Uh, uh, generation in some some cases mm -hmm. you see that the prompts are not giving you good output so what's the reason maybe we need to in, improve that in fine tuning but what happens in fine tuning is this task if the tasks are not properly labeled by humans the model will learn whatever we feed in so if the tasks are not labeled properly fine tuning is also not going to give us a lot of good responses and you need good human levelers, quality of data, et cetera, et cetera, that comes into picture, which is a challenge of fine tuning. The other challenge is like um, the LLMs penalize the tokens, all the tokens equally. Now, if some of the tokens, let's say you have generated a response and you got 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 tokens, all the tokens may be not equally good. Some of the tokens are forced, actually, they are not really uh, contributing to the quality of the prompt response. LLM is going to penalize all of the tokens equally, which is not fair. So this fine tuning this is another challenge of fine tuning. And what we should do for mitigating that is probably give a good rate rating or scoring for those or penalizes and model for those tokens so that we can improve the quality of the prompt responses from the language model. So this is the second stage, which is about fine tuning. And the third is prompting, which is you can see by this image is like it makes everything very simple. You just have things ready somewhere and you go there and take it. It's like a ready made food, right? Uh, order from Zomato or Swiggy. But uh, you see, if you have to prepare a curry at home, then that much of effort you need to put chopping vegetables, make uh, you know, all the ingredients ready, have your uh, cooking stove ready and put uh, oven there, uh, put the facial there. So a lot of things like then you go and cook from scratch. Um, and it may be possible that somebody has made those ingredients ready and then you just uh, start cooking it. And maybe somebody has already everything ready. You just order it, right? So the third stage is like the prompting stage where you have everything ready and you uh, start prompting or chatting with the large language model, right? So the large language models are basically um, 
in a way that it is helping um, us to do a lot of uh, conversations. There are two different type of large language models that are pretty much available technically. One that is instruct following, right? So we provide an instruction to the LLMs and you get a response out of it. And the other is like a chat completion, right? So you uh, have a uh, conversation like an assistant, right? So an assistant uh, kind of model. Now, uh, how does it different? It basically been trained with those kind of NLP tasks. NLP task is about instruction following, then it is going to be an instruct LLM, right? We call it an instruct LLM. That's the one of the base LLMs. So the other is like the chat completion LLM, right? Where we are basically asking the chatbot to behave like an assistant and you are chatting with it. All right, so th those are the different ways to uh, build LLMs. Now, um, I I'm not yet talking about RLHF, but just this is just to have a comparison that what are we going to discuss in RLHF section. Um, I I personally feel that RLHF is something that you may not require in a lot of use cases. And in a lot of the use cases, it is very much important. So how do we differentiate that where do we need RLHF and where do we do we, we don't need RLHF? Not all the LLMs, uh, considering the ROI of it, um, it's not always feasible to have an RLHF based methods and use those methods. So, and maybe there are things that are coming up beyond RLHF, but for now, it's basically having a LLM from scratch, like the I, I showed you the previous slide, uh, LLM from scratch, then you do fine tuning methods. If both of them doesn't work, you try with uh, more uh, like a prompting technique, like zero sort, few sort, multi sort, etc. And then the fourth stage is basically you go for RLHF method, right? So I'll show you a, a flow chart that actually describes that when to go for fine tuning, when to go for RLHF based fine tuning. So here you can see that uh, this this is a little bit blurry, but I will uh, quickly have that explanation. So in the first stage, right, you have a low quality of data and that you optimize for text completion. And then you basically feed into a language model and you get a pre-trained model. So this is the first stage where we called it like you um, you have a um, you have a simple um, LLM, right? Where you get the trained LLM model. And once you have this, then what, what do you do is you will uh, have a high quality data. So you improve the quality of data that you pass as a supervised fine tuning. Um, by the way, uh, like supervised fine tuning or SFT, right? SFT is more like, uh, um, it's, it's not about uh, sending prompt, but you train the language model, large language model as in fine tuning method. Um, and in this case, you have two different ways to do that. One that where we actually use LoRa technique, where we freeze some of the weights and then we take, um, I mean, we don't really touch the original LLM in any of these cases, right? Uh, so that way, what happens that you do not have a lot of uh, the huge amount of parameter trained on. Um, and the other thing is that you also don't uh, impact or, uh, you know, uh, basically modify the actual LLM that is being trained with. So let's say if a model is like uh, Einstein, you don't change the behavior of, an, uh, of Einstein by feeding in with new data and do fine tuning from scratch, right? I mean, fine tuning as in with a new data set. So uh, there is a problem that, all well known is like called catastrophic forgetting. If you are taking a lot of new data and fine tuning with it, it is going to create a catastrophic forgetting problem. Now, now SFT is all about that. So you take a lot of data and you do fine tuning and where you basically change the uh, weights of the LLM. So let's say I get a high quality data and I do a supervised fine tuning and I get a SFT. Uh, right and now this supervised uh, fine tune model further goes into a category called human feedback i will do deep dive into this part later but just to have an highlight that what are we going to 
discuss right so uh, now okay fine so i got high quality of data well, now this model is maybe sufficient for my use case but it may not be sufficient in that case what should i do how do i improve the model further you then collect human feedback in terms of rating and scoring of the feedbacks or the prompts that are that you are uh, receiving from this sft model and then you actually apply some kind of classification maybe an algorithm maybe a model uh, like a reward model and that reward model is going to be called as reinforcement learn okay so here you pass a prompt with uh, reinforcement learning which learns from your prompts gives a reward to that this reward model creates a final model now all of these stages some of you i i mean this is a very open webinar so i do not have a you know specific target audience i am assuming that all of you have good understanding of llms the fundamentals of llms uh, then i am explaining this uh, because there are there is a lot of background and uh, history behind this which cannot be covered in one and a half hour uh, webinar it is focused toward our lecture but yes if anyone have any questions that think that okay i quickly can touch upon uh, that's fine i can do that um so so this is what we are going to cover as a brief in the today's webinar okay all right any questions any queries anyone okay so the first thing that we should ask ourselves is why rlhf i mean do we really need rlhf rlhf the full form is reinforcement learning through human feedback so you are actually combining two different uh, world one is the rl rl world reinforcement learning world with human feedback now human feedback is very much uh, human intensive work and then other one is very much algorithmic intensive work first one needs a lot of lot more uh, efficiency in terms of bring good algorithm right efficient algorithm which is basically your rl algorithm and the other part is basically having good um, human labelers who understands the data who understand the subject do domain and given that domain ex expertise can label or rate your uh, prompt responses from the base llm or a fine-tuned llm correct all, all good so far everyone so this is uh this is kind of the thing or the flow of uh, understanding now let's say i have gotten uh you know a model that is already have a have a supervised fine-tuned which is a supervised fine-tuned model i have I have built a sft now this sft does this sft model perform satisfactorily for most tasks that's the question first question that you should ask if you got an llm maybe you got a llama 2 version let's say llama 2 is one of the open source la large language models equivalent to uh, gpt 3.5 you can say or close to 4 but not really kind of competitor of 4 i would say and there is another model mixtral which are like of llama 2 with the both are um, open source models so let's say I got an SFT and maybe I got this model, did some fine tuning with it, got an SFT, which is a supervised uh, way of fine tuning. And does that SFT model perform satisfactorily? This is the first question. If it does not, then you go for the other part. If it does, if you say yes, then you continue to use SFT. There is no further thing needed. You, you continue to use the SFT. But let's say if it doesn't, then the first, then the second question is like, are there recurring patterns of mistakes or specific type of prompts where SFT is underperforming? This is the second question asked. If it is underperforming for, uh, I am, I know this is a very blurry, uh, Ganesh, very blurry image, cannot zoom in um, much, but I mean, if it, it helps, let me know. Uh, but I, that's why I'm trying to, like give it give an explanation here let me know if it helps yeah cool so the second is like are you are you actually the second question is if your sft is uh, is giving any errors or mistakes 
context in the prompt responses then you observe that and based on that if it if it doesn't um, then you consider selecting more diverse or representative data for sft uh, maybe a different uh, sft or a different data set if it if it does you see a lot of mistakes um, and the prompts are basically underperforming in that case you go for other question that is can the mistake be corrected can we correct those mistakes and provide more explicit labels in sf right this is the this is the second uh, third question that you have if it does not if it you cannot create or you cannot correct the mistakes by simply providing more explicit labels because what you have done in sft is like got a label data set did a supervised based fine tuning and if it doesn't then you should ask like are you able to gather comparison data for reward modeling because this needs a lot of human effort and if you can then next bottleneck is like can you afford the computational resources because you need a lot of intensive gpus to do this fine tuning right fine tuning itself is costlier uh, because you need to have hours of gpu training for getting those, I mean, depends on amount of data, the size of the model, 7 billion, 3 billion, 13 billion, 50 billion, whatever, right? So, or, um, uh, and, and based on that, you take that GPU cost, right? And if you do not have, then look for optimizations. If you do not have GPU, um, uh, or you do not have affordability to have GPUs, then look for optimizations or consider staying with SFT for now. So you compromise with it. But if you have both, a uh, good amount of uh, reward modeling like human labelers and you have gpu cost available then you go for the rlhf so right which is the last stage of getting the model trained with rlhf technique so good so far everyone why rlhf and when to progress with rlhf and reward modeling any questions yeah let's ask a lot of questions to make it interactive yeah i don't want uh just to explain things you will find these things in in the over the internet so let's make a interactive session and if anyone have any i mean don't worry about questions being basic it doesn't matter or if you have any other uh use case basic questions you can ask me would be glad to help Andrew, one question. Yes. Uh, with this RL, RLHF, you need uh, you need this labeling data by humans, yeah. which is very yeah. actually time consuming. Yes. So I heard something about RLAIF. Mm -hmm. um, can you cover that in briefly, or maybe we can talk later as well? I can talk later, but I haven't really looked at AIF. But I, I am aware of it. But I would say that uh, there are many techniques to that, like some of the policies that say you use another LLM to do that. Yeah. Ultimately, you go for in another LLM that is that see you say you say that if you take a 10 very expert uh, you know people who are good at summarization, they also may not give you very high quality of data. Mm. If you are relying on LLM, then that is also another point that comes in how much good quality of data you will get from another llm which is also trained with the data so you are having a synthetic right way of getting those yeah right. another question i have is that is fine tuning absolutely needed because it's also expensive so in your experience can uh, intelligent prompting suffice for most of the use cases or yeah. let's say for domain specific let's say i'm come from telecom so for telecom related stuff where there's a lot of lingo a lot of a uh, lot of words that are not probably in general dictionary mm. uh, you may not get great responses yeah. what's your what's your suggestion on when to use prompting versus when to use supervise i mean i understood this flowchart pretty good 
but uh, everyone mostly starts with advanced prompting first and then if it doesn't work then go to sft you have any comments on that yes yeah, so um, very good question kedar thanks for asking that um, fine tuning helps like let's say in case of when you do have very very much a lot of data available to you for your domain and the other thing is that you are you have a lot of tech jargons that are may not be available as an open source data like these llms are trained with a lot of internet data i mean the whole internet data you can say a fraction of the internet data so in that consideration if you have you are you need let's say for example a telecom specific llm and you have a huge um business acumen around that uh, getting a lot of roi so then you compare the cost and you see what is the roi you can bring and then you probably think of doing it sft but before that let's say i'm not going even an sft i am trying to use i'm taking a uh, maybe a gpt4 or i might be taking a, a llama 2 uh, now llama 2 is uh, having 70 billion till 70 billion parameter let's say available today and in future it is going to be more and more so uh, maybe that approach when you take a base model and you do prompt based uh, tuning you know prompt based tuning which is basically uh, i would say not full fine tuning sft is a full fine tuning method where you need but where you do prompt based tuning you have these um, complex prompting basically providing a prompt giving a guideline giving a context that model is learning from your inputs so in case of gpt4 it is moderated by open ai so we cannot control what prompt goes to open ai and how those prompts are being feeded into the model to do the further tuning fine tuning not sft but it's a prompt based tuning so let's consider that part if we have an our own uh, open source llm let's say llama 2 then you have these moderated prompts right from your organization maybe there are hundreds of employees who are basically doing prompts every day those prompts are collected somewhere moderated by some algorithm or moderated by some kind of mechanism and those prompts are only going to the model for doing the prompt based tuning that approach if that works then you do not go for sft that helps uh, then we are good but let's say i mean if, if you do not choose to do that and let's say you go for sft what if tomorrow your requirement changes your domain data also increases after 2 years 3 years again you have to incur that cost so there is a drawback and there is also a good uh, thing about that but if it doesn't ultimately solve your problem with sf i mean with with with, with prompt based tuning then you go for sft that's the simplest answer i would say uh, what i think is more decisive for a good for sft not even rlhs right so yeah, yeah okay good thanks does that help yes yes thank you okay any other questions yeah i any? also wanted to ask one thing so uh, i'm not sure that whether that concept will apply here or we are actually covering that so when we are actually doing sft and we have a federal learning system so uh, i'm confused that does it uh, apply here like can we apply federal learning infra to the like this uh, framework that you are showing uh federal learning in the sense sorry i uh, honey if you can explain me i'm not yeah so i'm in the federal learning what we do is that rather taking data to the model we take model to the data in the in the layman terms okay. so it's it's a kind of uh, the privacy with where we want to maintain so when we are doing sft uh, the privacy of the data will not get compromised of the uh, organization although it's an evolving field but uh, maybe i'm i'm maybe we are not but, using but this concept now yeah i think yeah. the fundamental thing that lies honey is a very good question about this i mean if you bring the data bring the model to closer to data see it's a very common phenomenon from the big data world as well yeah uh, yeah where you actually uh, put the algorithm 
where the data is rather than bring the data where the algorithm is mm -hmm. but it fundamentally it just changes the efficiency of uh, gathering the data or getting the data to the model but it doesn't it improves uh, the efficiency of um, the responses but in case of llms i would say yeah, fundamentally you are you are actually what you are doing in sft you are changing the weights of the model if you are mm. the weights of the model, uh, the beat, the data being with the same GPU server, you might reduce the amount of GPUs needed, the amount of memory needed, mm. use the cost. But uh, ultimately, that is going to incur cost, which is maybe let's say if I have fifty percent cost, then you might consider going for SFT. So that might help in that direction a little bit. Okay, okay. But, but okay. The LLM's learning process remains same. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Yes, Akash, uh, Akash, sorry. Yeah, not, not a question, but uh, just trying to give some thought towards the previous one. Sure. You can apply RLHF in federated learning as well. Similar concepts are translatable. Uh, it's a very specialized area in case you, you know, for example, you have privacy preservation operations. You could still do the same operation in the flowchart as you have explained before. The only way the setup will be distributed to cover the local instances where the data is, stay, is saved and the federated server would still act as whatever it is supposed to be doing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Perfect, Akash. Thanks for the input. These areas are very much evolving, and even the RLHF area is a, still. We say that what would be the best algorithm, or how efficiently we can do this. I would think that I, I, I personally feel like in in maybe a couple of or six months, or maybe in in a year, we will see a lot of advancements in this, and maybe people will focus in reducing the cost because that's one of the huge challenges of SFT and and then going for our age of things okay so this is one of the uh, very you know interesting image uh, by this uh, scientist known as chief Yuan, right so um, unsupervised if you have an llm which is basically big monster let's say having unsupervised data there is no um the whole whole internet you just extract and train with llm right and llms and so in this case, you have a lot of toxic information, maybe things that are not uh, really, um, I would say, authentic as an information and not maybe shareable information, PII data, a lot of things that are going into this as a, I would say, dump from the whole internet. So that's your unsupervised LLM that you get. Uh, and from there, you do SFT where you get this face, a little bit of you know targeting around a specific task, let's say if it is instruct LLM or if it is an assistant LLM. Then you see that, that it has got a smiley face, right? Which is the RLHF thing that you, you make it more human aligned through a human feedback. Something like if you have an information that is basically say, if I ask how to um, hack my neighbor's Wi-Fi, and you are going to get that response. Now, if I can achieve that by prompt, I don't need to go here. But let's say something that um, that that's a lot of uh, information which is prohibited or not to be answered, right? So you cannot really control the prompts, and there are a lot of things that are happening in the security area of LLMs. Uh, considering that we might think of getting these uh, specific human feedbacks ratings uh, for the prompts and maybe eliminating those prompts which are not really suitable for your organization or your kind of use cases. Okay. All right. So, um, Let's get into RL because this is about RLHF and the RL part, which is the reinforcement learning. Not going to spend a lot of time talking about RL. Uh, I would assume that 
most of you are already aware of what is reinforcement learning um there is a there is a game that that's known as alpha go i don't know how many of you have heard of uh, the alpha go competition with a go player the the go top go player in the world right uh, so the alpha go was able to beat that person um alpha go was created by deep mind with several iterations and basically it's a reward based model that if you have a positive response then you get a reward or you get a penalty right if you do not get a positive response i mean we can build that kind of model which is a reinforcement learning agent right so this agent learning is very very much there uh, in the industry and uh, we just that take that rl kind of learning method combined with a human feedback so uh, why uh, fine tuning with rlhf um, you can see that how much although i mean this is not significant and there are a lot of things already in couple of months last couple of months has been improved in this rlhf area which i haven't included here like you guys some of you are to talking about rlhf with ai so and or maybe uh, federated learning method and bringing rlhf there um and and it, it's keep on evolving so uh, considering those um, areas are not yet been let's say covered but i'm i'm giving an kind of a comparison where we actually saw that open ai and the maybe facebook uh, lama 2 all of these are basically have some flavor of rlhf have been used there right so this is uh, where you see that fine tuning with human feedback uh, you can reduce not only the number of i mean you, with less number of parameters you are able to achieve good results uh, you can see that the fraction of model that is generated results with uh, preferred human response right so it's giving you the fraction then on this side you can see the size of the model that we are basically using okay, okay. so a quick uh, definition of rl i mean rl algorithm reinforcement learning so you have an environment we have an action based on the action you get a reward and based on that reward you will have an observation let's say either you get a good reward score or you get a bad reward score which is basically penalty or reward whatever you say right so um so now next going to this reward model uh, policy can we apply the rl policy in our llms can we apply the same uh, rl policy in the training of llms right so that's where we bring this rl algorithms to let's say rate a prompt or give a score to a prompt for example let's say we have a we were training a llm with a summarization task and based on that you have these sample s where you are going to have a prompt like summarize few points about python in 20 words so it says the first one says Python is a high level interpreted programming language known for its simplicity, readability and versatility and extensive libraries for various applications. And the second prompt it says let's say Python is widely used for web development data analysis. So maybe the first one is rate having a score the second one is having score more or less doesn't matter. Now, now based on the score you can say that whichever response is giving you the better output. uh prompts i have just shown here one prompt but it it is com combination of let's say two different prompts uh not the change in the prompt but let's say twice i have asked to the model every time you ask you will get a different response right from the model and then you guys might might have seen in gpt there is a like icon so you can actually like those prompts to vote for it and that kind of helps open ai to improve um or basically learn from your um responses that you have received whether it is a good response or bad response okay so now um these responses are let's say as a human we are liking those responses or we may be disliking those responses how if we have to do that something like that in our own organization 
it is kind of first of all that it is challenging in terms of getting uh, that much of humans to actually give a rating let's say if you get it also how do you actually moderate those ratings that means that that helps you control what to be used for the rlhf training right there you need an automated way that automated way is this rl algorithm the rl agent right so you feed this prompt along with um that the response i mean prompt responses and that is basically rewarded by this rl agent can this rl agent initially do this it is not been trained with anything let's say so obviously it is kind of not possible for the rl agent to learn immediately about what is a good prompt and what is not a good prompt right and for that we need to give these human levels um with a preference so um this is the rlhf agent let's say the rl policy model just for an example and this policy model is um having an action so you see that uh, i was i was talking about this alpha go or let's say consider chess game right so in a chess game the whole chess board is the environment which is basically playing a big role in um in in terms of what how the behavior of the agent would be right if in the in that in given that environment there is a state so that state is uh state is initially let's say the players are in the position zero right wherever their position is let's say the players in a position zero and then the player one player moves to another cell so this is basically the change of the state now this move is a positive move or negative move should i mean should it be given a reward or should it be given a uh, penalty that's what actually been learned by the agent and what is the goal for every rl agent there is a goal what is the goal so let's say in case of chess winning the game is the goal in case of alpha go also winning the game is the goal right until it wins it is keep on having this action state reward action state reward being used okay so you have an action goes through the environment you get a state change right go objective is win the game and this is what is going on with an rl agent are we good so far everyone any questions the goal of the rl agent so i then we will i mean once we understand rl agent then we are going to combine human feedback with rl and then you can call it rl hf i i am trying to make it very simplified to a lot of folks because this is a versatile webinar and uh, there are different people different background some people have very uh, you know uh, good understanding of let's say beyond rl hf maybe and some people have very fundamental understanding of deep learning so given that or maybe llms right so given that uh, if if this is understandable i would think that it is kind of helpful to all of you any any questions so uh, more of an applied question uh, from creating environments perspective am i audible this is akash Yes, Akash. Yes. Okay. Uh, so mo more of an applied question from environment perspective. I've been trying to put this into finance, and uh, is there a good framework that can help define the environment uh, specific to financial systems? Okay. You meant uh, uh, creating the RL environment? Yes. Yeah, I haven't explored for the finance domain, okay. Akash. if anyone have any inputs can give it but i have no sorry i i might check it later and no problem I'll, i'll i'll post the question in a group the goal was to create a uh, i was playing with uh, um an ml algorithm that can work in a market like a share market mm -hmm. and i was trying to create a environment for which which mimics a share market 
uh, it was becoming very difficult to manage it because of the complexities involved. So I thought if there's something pre-existing, I used the gym and all, but uh, couldn't go anywhere beyond basics. Great. No, I I think that's yeah. a try. But I think Akash, yeah, anyone was saying something? See, the key to RL is setting up the environment correctly. Yeah, yeah. Like state action reward paradigm. Yes. So, uh, you know, if if you can represent the environment in the terminology of RL, you can hope to apply various RL algos. If correct. the environment is not representative correct correctly, then RL will not be effective. Uh, so uh, RL is basically uh, one of the most effective optimization algorithms, right? So it is meant to optimize stock market portfolios, mutual fund portfolios, you know, chemical formulation, drug formulation, so drug discovery, uh, so, you know, supply chain optimization. So RL is basically an optimization technique. Uh, so, but getting the, setting the environment is 50% of the challenge. And after that, if you get the environment right, then seeing which algo will do the job is the remaining 50% of the challenge. So gaming is, of course, one of the largest consumers of RL because gaming is all about optimizing uh, player performance, right? So even sports, etc. Uh, so yeah, I mean, we have a course and a pack in Cellshed Hub on RL, but we haven't had a chance to delve in Cellshed beyond that, really. Because RL is too complex. It's very hard to set up RL environment and actually do it. So I was surprised to see that OpenAI was successfully able to apply our RL to GPT optimization. So, the, but you know, OpenAI is OpenAI. You know, they have army of PhDs. Uh, so, and then they have some of the RL inventors in their team, probably folks who wrote the book on RL. <laughs> so. Uh, Okay, anyway, that was just some general comments. Others can pitch in. No, thank you. I think that's very, very uh, precisely what I I've been struggling with. The algorithms were mostly fine, but the uh, environment creation was a extremely complex problem. Beyond the basics, you can create basics like uh, from a gaming perspective, uh, chess engines, go engines they are very readily available robot dancing car bumping into walls these kind of basic uh, monkey dancing and all of these will you will find but when you take it into business yes. domains and try to build a a, a true uh, environment uh, it's it's really it becomes see complex. i would point you to shobha manikarnike she was our community team lead for reinforcement learning and she did a lot of R&D in this. She created a, a very popular RL course as well, Deep Reinforcement Learning. So she did a lot of study of this. And she uh, studied the core book by Rick Barton of University of Alberta, who was sort of the creator of RL, one of the first pioneers. So Shubha can help a lot, actually. And in fact, she was showing me some demos on financial modeling as well. Uh, but yeah, I think Sunil has some comment here. So, uh, so thank you, Vivek. Uh, I I want to kind of uh, divert the conversation from the what to the why, and and I, I'm I'm not a technical expert, but uh, why should we consider RL um, in in a setting? And and the reference point I'm giving, since you talk about gaming, is uh, you know test. Uh, as a uh, you know, as a computer-operated game has been there for decades now. It has evolved, right? Uh, if you look at any of the other gaming platforms, um, you know the, whether it's Nintendo, PlayStation, they they handle a lot of very very complex uh, simulations, right? Because they have to anticipate how a gamer will play and they have to respond. Right, uh, and you know, I've played FIFA a few times, and it is it's extremely um, complex in terms of how they model. So, why should one consider RL? What is the advantage over the existing capabilities that are out there? Okay, so I let me take that um, as Sunil. I think um, I mean RL. Definitely, why should we consider is human extensive work, like, for example, this labeling work. 
have to hire thousands of people to have a good quality of data for doing the training of your LLMs is going to be eventually very um, costly and also not efficient. So for that, in case of LLM context, I can tell that why the RL, RL algorithms are happening because you are basically employing a bot to do that scoring or rating. Yes, Akers. Go ahead. No, no, uh, you can finish and I'll try to add to it from the why perspective. Yeah. So, uh, so this is basically one way that these RL agents are employing as in like replacement to the humans, right? Uh, which is helping you to do this data labeling and also making the data more accurate. And over the time, you see this is very, ex I mean, humanly, it is very expensive and very extensive. And it's not really possible to maintain a good quality of folks from a particular domain and get those people to do labeling. It's kind of boring job as well. Now, if for let's say for a certain time you do that, and then the RL agent learns from these behaviors and the policy and environment you set correctly based on that, and then you you have this like what OpenAI even and big companies like OpenAI did. So uh, considering that, I think RL is playing a major role here. Um, and this is what I think why the RL has been used. But I, I beyond that, I, I mean, if Akash, you want to add, please. So I can add a few things. Sure, please add. Please add. Okay, sure, sure. So I, what I can add is easy. In gaming, I'll say the difference between what in finance and uh, gaming. See, gaming is a constrained environment, I would say, when compared to finance. See, RL in a gaming, uh, you, you know what which dimensions that you can cal you get the rewards from. But when it comes to finance, right? See, it's a complex problem which involves various factors. Like some, some uh, in one country, if there is uh, there was a bomb blast. Then you you see that market uh, stock market going down. So it's a totally different. You have various parameters that comes into picture when it comes to RL in finance. But it is it is definitely see it's it's more of a reward optimization that you do right with with uh, uh, with reward see, RL and moreover RL is a data intensive algorithm which means you need more data for it uh, and various factors are involved when in a finance domain that is that is one of the major problems uh, in optimizing rewards in a finance space Yeah, so I, I, I can probably go back to what Sunil was asking. Sunil, you are saying something? Well, I was trying, still trying to get the answer on why RL, because, you know, it's not about the application on uh, gaming versus, uh, Got it. you know, what I was... Got it. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to, FIFA. to, try and, to uh, give you an you know, I'm playing against Messi as, yeah. So how would RL make that experience of playing FIFA better than what I already have? Sure. So, so let me try and take a non-application centric approach. So essentially when you deal with real world situations, irrespective of the domain, you have, you almost always end up into some kind of an optimization problem. An optimization problem, as I think Vivek was mentioning, is essentially a very heavy constraint programming problem. It's not about the algorithm but it's more about finding that state in which there is, let's say, an equilibrium between reward and penalty, as we call it in RL. So where RL comes into picture, and this is across domains, be it gaming, finance, supply chain, all of that, you are able to depict the real world with a set of instructions and uh, data flows to it and through it. And then what happens is you have the model of a real world of a, of, a, of a system. Just give me a second. So you have the real world uh, simulation. And then what you do is you try to throw in your problem, specify those constraints, and try to improve and optimize. So essentially, RL is helping you simulate your problems better. Now, going back to your FIFA question, Let's say you have a certain state where you are trying to kick from a corner, right? And your the behavior of the players are are becoming predictable, and the goal is to make it you know as unpredictable as you want for players to play. 
So what a gaming company would do is try and optimize for unpredictability. Now, it's, unpredictability is a very hard thing to do when you think in terms of an algorithms. But what RL does is, given the correctness of the environment, it's able to rightly simulate that playing conditions and then optimize for you know less predictive behavior for the gamer for supply chain it could be you know under understanding the distribution networks and all of that for finance it could be understanding how a certain pricing is behaving given the different market dynamics so essentially it's a it's an optimization and simulation engine and then when you break machine learning into it, it becomes an incredibly powerful tool for you to solve different kind of business problems and domains. Yes. I hope that answers some of the why. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Indrajit. Yes. Yes. More importantly, Hello. this one is spacecraft video that uh, DeepMind has published. Just go and watch it. You'll, you'll get a better picture of how it is being used. Yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, Kalyan, thank you. Moni, Mai, you can yeah. go ahead. So, so uh, I think coming to your uh, question on uh, the uh, gaming and things, let's think about a chess game, right? So chess game, uh, there are billions of states can be available, right? And you cannot explore all the states, right? But you still need to really to get the, uh, get the how the system will be behaving, right? So so what Alan does is that it just learns from means uh, some of the states, whatever, whatever you can explore it. And then uh, it's 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 actually by rewards and things actually it defines itself. Okay, we cannot explore all these states, but we want to use a some states which which knows right, and from this it actually generalizes stuff. Okay, so that's why the uh, that's why the uh, the other main objective is the long term reward it has to optimize. Okay, and uh, we cannot have if we have if we can explore all the visual states probably we do not data analysis right because. And do it maybe maybe quantum things uh, tomorrow, tomorrow can do it right but uh, but as um, someone uh, uh, wanted this optimization problem and we need a strategy for getting the best out of it right that's the reason i is needed thanks yeah perfect thanks money my for the inputs so i think uh, it's a great uh, discussion so far um, and thanks for all the inputs that right, everyone even alpha go is there is a youtube uh, video cascade i i mean it's one hour i think one and a half hour video that's also a great uh, uh, experience that you can have have a look like how alpha go is an rl based model that helped um, defeating uh, the best go player right so it was not an easy task and uh, there is a huge amount of computation and as well as learning that they have done over the time they build the environment over the time talking to a lot of go players over the world that they have given input visiting the office as in uh, you know with sitting with the algorithm experts and the developers and they built the algo alpha go algorithm for over the period and then they were also not really confident that it is going to um you know defeat the go player and go, and obviously it was like a kind of very heartbreaking uh moment for korean you know uh folks because they were like for them alpha go is like a huge uh, fan following and it, it's a huge um, I, I think everyone plays uh, in Korea, right? So 80%, 90% of the people. So for them, it was a heartbreaking moment. You see a, a machine defeating a human. But um, considering that, so definitely there is a huge potential in every aspect. And you guys have summarized that well. So thanks for all the inputs. Uh, let's move ahead. Um, OK, and then we can go to the conclusion of this webinar because we are almost uh, closing near to the time. OK, so um, uh, the overall the process is like you collect the human feedback. In case of LLMs, you collect the human feedback. You have various policies that are used for sampling a set of uh, summaries, let's say. And for the two summaries, you get a human who says that, OK, this is the rating or this is the score. right? And then you get those scores feed into a RL or reward model. And that reward model is going to give you a loss or score and that based on that, you collect those human feedbacks, which, which are basically rated well by the RL policy. And 
this is what you are feeding into the model. So in, in very quick um, uh, overview, like you have these uh, prompts data set, you have uh, so many of sample uh, prompts. This is basically the initial LLM that is you might have got as an open source model, or maybe you have your own LLM and you get these humans for scoring the prompts, right? So these uh, prompts that are maybe scored from high to low is giving as an output to the reward uh, preference model, which is going to give you a score for those prompts. Okay. Each prompt is once it is rated, let's say I have an example, like there is nothing you can do about hot houses. Prompt is my house is too hot or you can cool your house with air conditioning or it is not too hot. So in this case, if I have three human levelers, they are going to rate those. And based on that score, you collect those human feedbacks, uh, rank them correctly, and based on the rank that you are feeding into the RL algorithm. So the RL algorithm actually gets this uh, particular prompt. A dog is a furry animal, let's say, and it gives a score to it. That score determines how good or bad is the response okay now here you see this this rl algorithm just i mean it's a it's a black box that we don't know what rl policy we are going to use so one of the popular uh, policy that are being used with llms are called proximal policy optimization ppo there are ppo uh, ppo and dpo which are getting popular and there are things that are happening with dpo that it is saying that you don't need to use that much of um, maybe reducing the amount of human effort. So I am not going into deep dive into the, the each of these algorithms as per this webinar, but going to give you a glimpse of that. What is this PPO is doing here, right? Uh, as an example. So what happens is like you collect these prompts like a dog is a furry animal or they, this house is very ugly. Right. So each of these are going for the base LLM, which is the instruct LLM that you got after SFT, maybe or uh, uh, yeah, SFT, let's say. So now each of these prompts are uh, going to feed it into the reward model. The reward model is going to give a score to it. Right. And this score is going to be passed through the value function, which is going to tell me that what is the total mm -hmm. reward for the uh, particular prompt. The total reward determines the K basically KL divergence there is a uh, value that actually tells you how good mm -hmm. or how bad the reward is okay so i'm not going to really go for these mathematical terms for now uh, given the time that we have if i quickly summarize it i have an initial model i got some prompt here and you feed that with the tuned rlhf so you notice here that we do not really touch the actual LLM weights, but rather what we do is with this tuned uh, language model with the RL policy, we get a reward system that we are actually getting as a score to it, right? That's what we are feeding into the reward model. And this reward model is going to give me the reinforcement learning, which is basically again uh, go back to the cycle. So this is happening at this stage that we are actually adding with our initial language model weights okay so this is this would be the final stage where we will be using a prompt getting it rewarded by the uh, reward model validating it by kl divergence and update the model over the time so this part which is basically not the actual weight of the llm but rather creating a weight matrix that is additional to the actual llm weights and you adding with so you might have seen this LoRa or QLoRa techniques where we don't really update the actual LLM weights, but rather create a separate matrix altogether based on the fine tuning method. Similarly, with the RL algorithm, we can have a separate matrix weight matrix that is being trained with a prompts that are basically rewarded by the RL algorithm. Okay, so how do we do that uh, i mean there is a i wanted to show a quick uh, thing that there is there is a uh, you know tool like there are many many tools available called rl studio and there is a tool called label studio um 
so you can actually have this thing started locally and you can feed your data to that rl studio label studio and that label studio can be used for labeling your data set so let me see if i i have started this on my machine locally and i'll quickly jump into that so let's say i have got a project created here generative ai human feedback with rlhf and i've got some prompt and the answers to that for example let's say what is the latest news on stock market so i have got two responses let the spotlight shine on something big something that matters or here are five things you should know about market so you can choose any of these select that and update it and this is going to be like captured from this label studio this is the part where you are using human mm -hmm. maybe you can share with a lot of people and uh, i mean the extensive resources that who are going to label this information and uh, uh, prompts basically and then based on these prompts you can create your labeled data set okay which we will be using to feed into your rl algorithm for further reward based model training once your rl agent is trained let's say pp or dpo then you are continuously able to use it and you can you no longer required to have human label for that until you achieve a certain accuracy of your prompts or better prompt responses okay all right so far any questions anyone so so one one very uh, slightly digressing which uh, related question uh, so I'm, I was looking at Kalman filters. It's not really an AI topic, but it uses somewhat similar uh, high-level algorithm, right? Yes. So instead of yes. the supervised piece, there is a measurement piece, and then it uses these weights to dynamically adjust the the which measurement it's going to give priority or the estimate. So yes. is there any like any anything that combines the best of the two worlds, like Kalman filters and and RL, or is there, is there anything like that? I haven't seen that uh, really, uh, but what I understand is like in the, uh, yeah, anyone saying something? Uh, what I have seen is uh, with this Kalman filter and also especially in the RL models, what happens that there is, there is a term that is being used, which is whichever is preferred as an RL, let's say as given reward, but actually choosing that and you don't really compare with two different uh, outputs that you are getting, unlike the supervised model training. In that supervised model, what happens if there are two different two different outputs over, I mean, if you talk about the graph, you may consider those which are maybe not uh, totally differentiable in the sense that in Kalman filter, let's say if I have two graphs, I will be actually choosing this part, which is I'm, I've got as a response. But in case of normal SFT, it's the whole area that is being chosen, right? Um, your question is more of like, can we combine these two words? Uh, is it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's at a higher level, right? I mean, it's at a much more dumber level, rather. Mm -hmm. You know, so like, is there any look? You know, so Kalman filter was developed by Professor Kalman, and and it was at a time where AI did not exist, right? And it was very mathematically focused right. on at assigning weights, and then how he extended that problem to to using matrices and and you know like kind of expand that uh, application of it to any generic uh, problem yeah. and so he did most of work there but then with with now that we have ai so that estimation piece of it inside of kalman filter could be done with a with the black box estimation tool right which is ai so i was thinking from that term that if there is any stream or any 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 uh, research on how to improve improve the carbon filter using ai i think there are a lot of things going on but i'm not i mean a lot of things in the sense in this area especially every month my, there are 5 10 20 papers only just around this so i haven't explored if there are things but there might be i mean i'm not sure I if anyone have, yeah yeah there could be something that is going on with this uh, and this area, I, I believe another couple of years, which is kind of less explored. I mean, you see that 
uh, last when LLM when LMs were there and LLM came just one and a half year, we see so much of development there, especially in the fine tuning methods and everything. RLHF is something I would say still less explored, even as Akers was saying, like there are no good environments available. Maybe there are a lot of open source tools that will be coming in in future, which will be having the ready-made environments provided and you try out with those RL environments. Similarly with KL, uh, you know, KL divergence, Carmen filter, all of these, I think definitely there would be a lot of uh, things that are already going on as a research, but coming to tool or ready-made stuff, maybe it will take a little bit longer time. I see, I see. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. See, I mean, a lot of AI is based on statistical, you know, models. So there's a lot of overlap. So Kalman filter will find a reference in many AI research papers. And there are some AI variations of it as well. So I think the overlap between traditional statistics, data science, and AI is quite big. So it's hard to say where statistics or data science ends and AI starts. Because AI itself is based on lots of statistical data science models. So I think yeah. this Kalman filter and older predictive or optimization right. techniques will find reference in AI here and there. Right. Yeah. right. No, yeah, yeah. I, I was I was thinking around those lines too, because Kalman filter specifically for a few problems, right? Like uh, a lot of these drone industries, which is apparently booming, uh, at least in India, they, all of those guys, they just blindly use Kalman filter for uh, motion prediction and all that. Right? So they have, they have multiple sensors uh, providing the same data and Kalman computer filter really just uh, selects. In, yeah, computer vision has good applications and Kalman filters. Yeah. It's, right, it's right. But that can be improvised, you know, if there yes, is an yes, AI the and, and edge. Exactly. I completely yeah. agree. You, you, you can model it. Exactly. I see. I see. Good. Good to know. OK. Uh, so all right, I think great discussion. And uh, there is a, I mean, I haven't really prepared any separate notebook for this, uh, for RLHF, because given the computational challenges and other stuff, I mean, if you guys wanted to have a look, there is a good notebook that is available from Hugging Face. Um, for you know getting these uh, responses ready but they have done it with gpt2 not uh, big llms um, and uh, once you have these like some of the prompts and you can just use label studio which which i just showed you all of all of you and you can rate them based on that uh, and update those uh, all of those prompts and once you update you will get a updated uh, labeled uh, data set and then you can fit into your GPT-2 model and train it. I mean, this is very basic example that where you will probably see that how the uh, accuracy is improving by ha having a better um, label data set. And then here you see the PPO is being used for training the whole model. I mean, sorry, I oh, in the interest of time, we could not explain the whole notebook. But if anyone would like to explore it further please uh, feel free to do so and share it here and if you have any questions you can reach out uh, later as well to us and would be happy to discuss on this all right so with that i would uh, like to conclude uh, today's session and if any questions let's take those questions yes sunil go ahead any book references apart from the what's called Sutton's book? Vivek, if you have Sorry, on I the... missed that question from again, Akash. Any book references, Vivek, apart from Sutton's book? See that uh, the one RL chapter which is slightly more easily understandable is the common uh rl uh, you know deep learning book what is that i forgot the name the most common popular deep learning book they have one chapter the last chapter on i'm just checking on amazon that chapter is a book on uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning by uh, maxim lapan uh, ah, lapan is good, good correct book. lapan is yeah, good that's correct good book. yes yes highly recommended lapan has a course on coursera also i believe uh, or he's a oxford or you know a uk professor so uh, Lapan is very good, much more easier to understand than Rick Sutton. Rick Sutton's yeah. book is very he, he, hard to understand. And, and it is very practical. I mean to say he, he'll have all the code snippets. 
it is it is quite extensive and uh, he explained every every detail correct correct max lapan is highly recommended even mm -hmm. when subha made her rl course uh, her primary reference was max lapan's course or book i believe thank you all right any other questions sorry did you share the notebook uh, uh, indrajit uh, i did not yeah, see it in the chat in the chat is it it's there yeah. in the chat please check that yeah okay all right so uh, and one last thing that i want to say if you i mean we have a flagship product on using generative ai especially gpt4 and i will share signing sign up link please feel free to sign up and try out the product there is a free subscription available so here is the link okay any other questions sunil is that the previous hand raise uh, or you have any new questions let me know i want to check where can we go uh, no sorry it was the previous one I okay should... yeah yeah okay yes muzamil where can we get the recorded uh, uh, recording of this session is it, it will be uploaded in youtube uh, right vivek yeah so our ai lab members get the the record when a recording sooner and after a few weeks uh, it is open to public on our youtube channel if you want to become our ai lab member do reach out to me uh, my number has been shared in the chat i am sharing it again so you can become our ai lab member for collaborative research and our members get access to the recorded webinar sooner and even the public gets it but after some time through our youtube channel any other questions folks uh, great session by indrajit uh, uh, you know good overview of our in context of you know generative ai uh, any other questions Okay, Indrajit, are we done? Yeah, we are done. Thank you, Vivek. Okay, Thanks, thank everybody. you all for joining. Then, uh, do reach out and uh, let's collaborate. Thanks, Indrajit. Excellent session. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye.